I don't know why he still struggles with the titles. He's my brother. And His Excellency Governor Otichilo, I've learned so much about you. I'm so happy to meet you. Uh, our senator and our leaders, I recognize our Judicial Service Commissioners, our PJ, and all the judges, registrars, the Vice Chancellor of this great university. Thank you so much for hosting us in this wonderful, tranquil environment. Thank you and your entire team. Let me also abide by the protocols that have been established and say a very good afternoon to all of you distinguished participants. Good afternoon again. Chemgel. Thank you so much. We are really honored, so, so much honored to be hosted at Eondoret, Washingishu County 027, the County of Champions, and to this great university that has produced great human resource capacity, rinders, distinguished rinders in many, many places. Now that this conference has happened here, your problems are over. You will claim your space of a leading public university because this conference about climate change has brought you blessings. You will never be the same again. We are here to support you, to pray for you because we know the critical law this university has planned to give education to our people. And having worked so hard and gotten to where you are, we cannot allow you to disappear. <laughs> yes, so thank you all the development partners. Thank you, Mr. Kili, uh, for that wonderful speech. I started hearing about it even before I arrived here and I was looking forward to meeting you because I think judiciary from here, we will also not be the same again. We will be sustainable. We will be resilient. We will put our money where it can grow. I think this conference will make a difference to many, many of us here. So allow me to start by really commending the Environment and Land Court for convening this timely conference to deliberate on the critical theme of the role of the courts in remedying climate change chaos. When I listened to His Excellency Governor Otichilo, and from where I sit, I think we have two existential threats in this country. Climate change, because when Justice Angote read the statistics of what recently happened during the planting, the number of lives we lost, and the number of people who are displaced, I happen to be a number in those people who are displaced. So I know it's truly an existential threat that we are facing with the climate change and also corruption, and because the two go together. So this theme highlights the reality that climate change as the defining challenge of our time. And it demands action not only from the policymakers, but from every institution, including the judiciary and individuals and communities. And I'm so happy about the thoughts that went through the organizing of this great conference because we involved everybody. We involved the stakeholders in justice, 
and we involved the stakeholders in the environment, we involved the communities, we involved the partners, and that is the way to go to empower everybody to stand up in defense and protection of our environment. Today, as the world grapples with the effects of climate change, devastating droughts, unprecedented France and dwindling natural resources, it is incumbent upon courts to chart a path of justice that safeguards both humanity and our planet. Climate change is therefore not merely an environmental challenge, but fundamentally a justice and human rights issue. It cuts across all of us. It is even more serious because it increases inequalities and disproportionality and impacts more on the vulnerable and the marginalized groups. Communities in harried and semi-arid areas, subsistence farmers, coastal dwellers, and indigenous people, many of whom contribute the very least to greenhouse gas emissions, bear the brunt of its consequences. Those least responsible for climate disruption are often the most affected. This demands a justice-centered approach to climate governance, upholding both distributive and procedural justice. Our roles embrace this justice-centered approach to climate governance, and we celebrate our transformative constitution 2010, which enshrines the right to a clean and healthy environment and principles of sustainable development and public participation in environmental governance. In addition, Article 69 obligates the state to eliminate activities that endanger the environment and establish systems promoting sustainable resource use. It is for that reason, I think, uh, Mr. Peter of Plocker said that those agreements that have been entered into without the involvement of the state on environmental sustainability and resource use are null and void. These provisions empower courts as guardians of environmental rights and distributive uh, equity to take charge and protect the communities and the states. Complementing this constitutional framework is the Climate Change Act of 2016, which was amended last year in 2023, and provides a very comprehensive regulatory framework for climate change mitigation, adaptation, and low carbon development. This legislative commitment recognizes humanity's ecological interconnectedness and dependence on the non-human world. Our constitutional and legislative guarantees compel the development of green jurisprudence by reimagining the court's role, not only as an arbiter of dispute, but as champions of sustainable development guardians of intergenerational equity, and defenders of environmental rights. And this is why we have descended from our courts to the level where communities live, to come and identify with our communities where they live in the counties, and they speak the same language of protecting our environment. Distributive justice concerns the equitable allocation of resources, opportunities, and responsibilities. In the context of climate change, we are all required to take our responsibility and bear the burden of climate impacts and the benefits of mitigation and adaptation. 
we should be distributed fairly across the society. Special attention must be given to the vulnerable and the marginalized groups. Disproportionality affects and dealing with the disproportionality of those affected by climate-related harm. Speakers have spoken about the vulnerable populations, and I need to emphasize these include the indigenous people, women and children who often face the greatest climate challenges. Courts must actively safeguard the rights of these vulnerable people. In addition, courts have the obligation to ensure that policies, environmental impact assessments, and adaptation projects prioritize inclusivity and fairness. Climate justice also requires addressing intergenerational equity because we recognize that decisions being made today will profoundly impact future generations. Therefore, Article 10 of the Constitution, which enshrines sustainable development as a national value, must guide the balancing of ecological, social, and economic considerations. If we heed the word of our pastor who spoke to us very eloquently this morning about the connection between God and man is the environment. And we do what we are supposed to do to restore the environment. Perhaps God can start now visiting us and speaking to us the way he used to speak to Adam and Eve. In Kenya, where communities face severe droughts, unprecedented rainfall patterns, and resource conflicts, courts have a vital role to play in ensuring climate action does not leave anyone behind. To achieve this imperative, courts must mediate competing interests while upholding equity and fairness. And this is why we are working together because we can never succeed alone as a judiciary or as a court. We must get the support of the county governments, national governments, and the communities. I am glad that the Environment and Land Court, the National Environmental Tribunal, and other courts have begun to forge a path in this direction. I want to mention a landmark decisions such as those by the Environment and Land Court on lifting or ban on logging in forest plantations. Let us appreciate the courts for preserving our forests. This reinforced the principle that environmental protection and resource management must benefit all, not just the privileged. These decisions demonstrate judicial interventions and their potential to create a more equitable climate future. This conference will be addressing procedural justice, which emphasizes inclusivity, transparency, and fairness in decision making. Procedural justice demands that those most affected by environmental degradation the vulnerable and the marginalized communities have meaningful opportunities to participate in shaping climate and environmental policies. And to ensure procedural justice, courts must robustly enforce three foundational pillars. The right to information, those who signed those carbon uh, agreements were they properly informed about their rights? Did they participate? And can they access justice? These pillars empower communities to foster accountability and ensure legitimacy in decision making. Therefore, access to information is critical for advancing environmental objectives. Uh, your Excellency, the Governor, I think we didn't come out of um, Baku empty-handed. You made a very good case 
there about the right to access to information about decisions that are being made out there that affect us and we have not participated in them. So transparency enables the public to understand and participate in environmental governance. We must be at the center of those decisions that make uh, affect us as countries in Africa. Our constitution also mandates our government agencies to provide timely, accurate environmental information, ensuring robust public engagement and fostering trust. In the landmark decisions, like the case of Friends of Lake Trukana versus Kenya Power, the courts emphasize the imperative of full disclosure to the public of agreements that have implications on sustainable management of natural, natural resources. Am I talking to somebody? Public participation also lies at the heart of Kenya's environmental governance. We know of Article 10 of our Constitution that enshrines public participation as a national value, mandating environmental assessments and public involvement before project approvals. Participation in enriches development by incorporating diverse perspectives, ensuring inclusivity, equity, and sustainability. Courts and the National Environment Tribunal have consistently upheld the principle of public participation, going to the extent of barring the implementation of projects that lacked proper environmental assessment or community involvement. And in this, I'll quote the landmark decision in the case of Save Ramu versus Nema, which underscored the need for sufficient public participation and consideration of climate impacts of development programs, thereby promoting accountability and transparency. When it comes to access to justice, ladies and gentlemen, our courts play a pivotal role. The Constitution's expansive standing provisions allow any person to seek redress for environmental harm, ensuring environmental rights are accessible to all. It is notable that the Supreme Court, in its landmark judgment, in the case of Abida Nicholas, which was delivered last year, affirmed that the environment and land courts is vested with the primary jurisdiction to redress violations of environmental rights under the Constitution, and a litigant is not required to exhaust alternative disputes resolution mechanisms in cases of violations of environmental rights because these are at the level of the constitutional rights and the human rights. The establishment of environment and land court with 52 judges in 40 court stations has significantly enhanced access to environmental justice. We have also put in place administrative arrangements, including the establishment of environment and planning as a division, and the land division of the ELC in Nairobi. Just last month, I gazetted an appeals division of the Environment and Land Court in Nairobi in order to improve the efficiency and the effectiveness of the court in dealing with appeals that come from the tribunal and from the magistrate's courts. For instance, the Environment and Planning Division in Nairobi resolved 87 cases compared to one or three cases filed in the, in the division that year. If we filed 67, 87, one or three cases and we resolved 87 cases, it means that the division is doing very well, which is a demonstration of our commitment to timely adjudication. The judiciary's role in addressing climate change extends beyond adjudication. 
In our social transformation through access to justice blueprint, we have made mainstreaming green practices one of the strategic object objectives we are pursuing. And the Chief Registrar of the Judiciary mentioned how we are working together with the National Council on the Administration of Justice and we have developed a policy framework and greening policy for each of the justice institution to mainstream greening justice within their activities. We are championing the integration of environmental sustainability practices in our institutional operations and practices. Some of these actions include adopting green building standards, enhancing digitization to reduce the use of paper, adopting sustainable procurement practices, employing the three R concepts of reduce, reuse, and recycle. We are also promoting green judicial practices such as green sentencing that involves persons convicted of petty offenses engaging in community work like planting of trees as a tool of decongesting our prisons. In addition, and in line with the multi-door approach to justice that we are championing as the judiciary, we must always appreciate that securing environmental justice is not just the domain of the courts. It requires a multi-stakeholder approach that includes alternative traditional justice systems, the AJS, such as the one we launched here in Eondoret, in Moiben. In many Kenyan communities, customary practices offer invaluable mechanisms for resolving disputes related to land and natural resources. These systems, rooted in communal values and sustainable practices, complement formal justice processes and enhance access to justice for the rural and marginalized populations. We are leaving no one behind. We are integrating NJS into the broader framework of environmental governance and ensuring that local communities are not only participants, but custodians of sustainable solutions. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, let me reiterate that the judiciary as a unique and indispensable role in addressing climate change. Through innovative green jurisprudence, we can transform climate crisis into opportunities for justice and sustainability. I urge all of us here to harness the transformative power of law, which we have been given through our constitution and other statutory uh, underpinnings that we have to secure justice and human rights in the era of climate disruption. Let us all champion sustainable practices that protect our environment for the present and future generations. And above all, let us reaffirm our commitment to environmental justice as a fundamental pillar of Kenya's constitutional democracy. And with those remarks, with the permission of all of us, especially the presiding judge, Environment and Land Court, the Great Court, the Tribunal, and all of us present here, I am honored, indeed most honored, to declare the 2024 Environment and Land Court Climate Justice Conference in this great city of Eldred, officially open. I thank you all for your attention, for your support, for your encouragement, for all those speeches that have been given here that are most encouraging and edifying. May you have wonderful, wonderful conference. Thank you. God bless you. I'm told there are photographs. <laughs>